Thank you. Bonsoir. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't go on too long. I want you to get to the movie. I realize that there are many possible things you could have done on a Friday night, and I am very grateful that you are here. It looks like a pretty full house, and that's great. Um, I am very proud of this movie and the collective effort that was made to, to tell the story. So I feel confident that many of you will be glad that you made this choice right now. Um, there's only one, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna say much else other than at the end, <clears throat> the end credits, there's a piece of music that kind of ties together or revisits several themes, musical themes in the movie that do characters and events. And it's also beautiful, in my opinion, last shot. Uh, it's a way to sort of <laughs> digest the movie, I suppose. And uh, so I'm not going to truncate that. We're going to play it right through. I understand people have things to do and they have to pee and I don't know what else. But, <laughs> but feel free to go, obviously. It's a free to go, free to do what you want. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll do the Q&A, which I'll be really happy to answer any questions as best I can. But it will be after that. So. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Well, I don't think it's safe. Thank you for that. We're very late in life. This is our very last screening. In fact, uh, it had been going so well, but they actually added this screening, and I thought, well, maybe we'll get it half full. Oh, so, thank you. Thank you all. So we're going to talk to the audience in a sec, but I wanted to get us for now. Vito, you uh, directed this movie, you produced it, wrote it, acted in it, you even did the music. When you're doing, when you met that many responsibilities, how do you keep yourself oriented on a project this big? Well, like most independent movies, it takes time. <clears throat> in non-independent movies, it takes time to find financing, to get your crew, to get everything in order, to find your locations. I had lots of time to prepare and think about it, and I worked uh, really hard, especially with Achi. She was here. Um, a large reason for why we finished the day early, and under budget, in spite of all the challenges we had, how tight the shoot was. Uh, our first AD, who, uh, a person I like to say, did the, did the work of 10 women and 50 men. Marcela Nama, Guerrero, Audiencia Most of the, almost all the score before we even started shooting, long before. 
you know, uh, when I was scouting, I found this location. I said, okay, this is our last shot. And I know roughly how long it's going to last because we'll include all the credits. That doesn't always happen. You know, a lot of times, most movies, I think they say, well, you don't have to put some and some, so, you know, let's keep the moving shorter. I said, well, it's precise that people get cut out. The assistant to the assistant to, you know, whatever. Who needed it the most? Who needed to say, well, what do I need to do? Or, and um, so we, we did that in the first movie that I did, and then also this one. And so I sort of gauged how long it would be. I saw the list of people. And um, I'm getting the music. And probably, I guess, about two thirds of the music that you hear uh, we recorded before. And the reason to do that, which sounds kind of backwards, but is because editing music and editing the pictures, I find is, I mean, I had a lot of experience with doing that with music for years before I directed the movie and was editing the pictures. Um, it's very similar. It's about finding the right rhythm. You know, it's like, okay, that's enough enough to say, we got to transition to something else. Or that shot will tell you how long it needs to last. You just need to watch it enough times. Okay, that's enough. Or a little longer. You know, what do you need to transition out of that scene now? Um, so it helped me to be efficient uh, along with the team, especially Marcel Ziskin, our cinematographer, and said, okay, these, these, these are the shots I need in this sequence, or in this transition, these two scenes, these three. Um, but so it, the music, I said, listen to this, and listen to it before. I said, this is what I want to do. He comes down the mountain, he comes up to the house, and that should take about this much time. And in some cases, they literally would rock it down the you know, and try and say, how long did that take? And you know, kind of about 10 seconds slower than that. Okay. Yeah. You know, and roughly, I mean, you can still tweak it afterwards. But we did that. It dictated the amount of shots, the rhythm of the story at that point. Because there's a lot of new challenges, especially in the first act, where you're trying to keep it moving and then keep it going. Okay. And, and is most of your planning intuitive in that way, or are you doing storyboards? Or are you finding it on the set? Shot list. Shot list. I do storyboards. I mean, I realize that sometimes if there's a very complex action scene, you might need to do that. But I didn't. I mean, I just like to be on locations with the, with the team, especially the cinematographers. If it is what I want to do here, and then he throws in his two cents, and then we come to an agreement. So okay, this, this, and no more, let's be really strict with ourselves and just do that. And the more prepared you are, and the more you stick to the plan, the more you might have a little wiggle room. It's like, well, let's try one more shot, or let's just go a little tighter there. But I don't want to be judicious about these close ups, especially in a story like this. That, you know, the structure's uh, different than classic westerns, you know, and the fact that there's a woman at the center of it, um, and you don't see the man going on. Thing is war, but um, it's still we're sh shot in a sort of like a classic western, and, and the music is sort of it's original music, but it's meant to be run to the 19th century, it was sort of Appalachian, Irish, and stuff. And um, and it was the same thing with the, the shots, you know, the types of uh, the lenses we were using, you know, yeah. Okay, so a question about the origin of the project. Uh, 2020, you know, lockdown, that was in Madrid, Spain. It was very severe there because they had a real problem. And it was a few months where you couldn't, you weren't legally allowed to go more than 250 meters from your house. If you were under 18, you couldn't leave, period. Um, and so I did a lot, I watched a lot of movies and I, I wrote a couple of them. And this was one story. And it's, I don't know, it's just writing the story and seeing that girl running through the maple woods, you know, forest, which was, you know, I was thinking about my mother, that's why it's, that's, you know, dedicated to Grace Campbell Atkinson. And little Grace, I was imagining, you know, running around, and uh, I looked here in the province for exactly the kind of slope, exactly the kind of trees. Where she's from, she's right on the other side of the border, on the other side of the Orange River, near, you know, where the Ontario starts um, or ends. And um, it was 
very much like that. And uh, yeah, I was just thinking about her. I don't know if she ran around and thought she saw a knight ever, but I know she had books like these hardcover books from her childhood that I now have with knights on the cover and different things, girls' books, but lots of you know, these colored plates, beautiful old books. And so I was looking through these books and imagining, you know, knowing that she was kind of, not exactly the name, but she was a kind of a, kind of a very independent-minded woman, a woman of her time, you know, in the same sense of being from her time, she's not like a wonder woman, but she's very strong-willed, has a very strong inner core, whatever my mom did too, you know, housewife, mother, three boys and all that, but I, the way that she would, for example, talk about books, and especially movies, which she would take me to all the time, when I was three, four, I remember being like about four and seeing Lawrence of Arabia with her, Dr. Chicago after that, and so forth, things like that. And she would talk about stories. So I knew she loved these stories, and she had this you know, rich imagination. If, it, if she was a woman from now, maybe she could be a mom, but also a screenwriter or something. You know? It was always stories. So that was where it started. And it was just, okay, so this little girl in the woods, and I'll call her Vivian. And it's, it's 19th century, and I said, what is this? I want to tell a story about a woman who, who is her own person. So let me start with her at the end of her life and see how she got there. And that structure is challenging, you know, <clears throat> to work with and make function in terms of uh, what you put together in the end. But for me, I mean, I make kind of movies I want to see. And you hope other people do. And you have to as an artist do that, uh, to be honest. And um, anyway, I like stories where I'm ahead of the character sometimes. And where you can, there's enough told to me that I can follow, but then I can make up the rest and I can draw my own conclusions. I like it when the audience takes ownership if they like it enough of the story and decides things for themselves. And there's a benefit in that out of sequence, kind of non-linear structure where you can see characters and get to know them after you've seen them, how their demise, you know, you see them, they're gone, but then you see them, you get to know them through the story, and on the second view, you see more details, more connective tissue, story-wise, and so anyway, that's sort of how it came about. And people have different, you know, some people say, well, that's a feminist Western message. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't want to label it. You, know, you could also say it's an anti-war movie. You, know, you could say it's just a movie about free, individual free will. And people who have the humility to respect, forgive sometimes, but respect the individual free will of others. You know? so I think it's about many things. And well, it's kind of if somebody just likes it enough to try to think of what it is. <laughs> Was the structure always there from the beginning? Because yeah. you're kind of almost starting at the end and then you open it up to the tenderness and some of the emotions. Yeah, and those first couple shots, you know, it's one shot, except for that vision she has, which you later learn what that is, this night writing down. Yeah. But the shot, which is one shot pulling back on her, and then the second scene is one shot, Weston, when he rides over the deck and kills his people. Those were always, that was the shot, you know, it was like, Day one, right. scene one, one shot. Like actually making it, uh, making the film in those locations and make all the challenges that you have to try to mm -hmm. build all these like beautiful views and lots of representation. So. Yeah, your experience making the film, tell us a little bit about maybe the locations and the places you shot. Uh, we worked really hard. We were trying to be, you know, with the budget we had, and be very efficient. I, I did several scouting trips to Mexico. We looked in different states. This was all shot in the state of Durango, which is very varied. As you see, there's deserts, there's canyons, there's <coughs> water, there's waterfalls, there's high mountains, forests. There's a lot. Um, we looked also Sonora. Baja California, I mean, there's a lot of places, but in the end, you know, Marcelo and I were clear on the fact that if we want to get this in, in that budget, and that kind of uh, time, that, that schedule, we really should find one 
one state where the distance is, you know, one long distance was to go up to the mountains to shoot where he said, I will encounter and the chase to the woods also. And it's one of the waterfalls. And it was worth it, you know, we went after him and spent four days and we did a lot of free in that time. And um, and what was great about these locations was that, you know, I'd be scouting and I would ask the guy who was taking us around, I'd say, so what movies have you shot here? He goes, no, it's the man trying to come into So it was kind of a treat for the audience because rather than being in Long Island, California or Monument Valley or wherever, or in the south of Spain or something like the mountains and ridge lines and vegetation, stuff you've seen before, and it's just and it's about being creative. Okay, let me shoot in the same location that John Ford shot in or Howard Hawks, but you know, more creative. We didn't have to do that. We had authentic looking, the vegetation was correct, the, the colors and the landscapes were correct, but they were different. You know, I mean, North America, huge place, and so we were able to enjoy for ourselves going in there and also showing you different places that were that suited. You know, we had to go to Canada and there was some talk, you know, some other could say more money you shot her all the next day. I said, it's not gonna look like the northwest of the United States in Mexico. It's <coughs> too beautifully turquoise, it's too tropical and it's just not gonna work and we don't have that kind of rainforest. You certainly don't have the hardwoods, the red oaks, the maples, and so forth. We didn't have in Ontario, so it's going to be tight. We're going to be super organized. I mean, all of a sudden, you see this Ontario, this must be, you know, North New York, Vermont, something like that. Um, we shot in two and a half days. We did that just for the interiors of the cabin and everything. And the stuff in BC, which was quite a few shots, two days. That was it. We went down to Mexico and had 28, 29 days. That was it. That's all the time we had. Well, what was maybe the most uh, challenging or unpredictable scene or sequence of the age shoot? If there is a memorable one. Um, well, I mean, those, the shot where Weston comes out, scene two, everything had to go. I wanted to be organic. You know, just, you know, little tiny unpredictable things had a camera movement but all the action is more or less right. Wind picks up whatever, it's okay. You just that was tricky because it was all in one shot. And scene one was tricky, but scenes like um, the saloon scenes, you know, some of them were tricky just to like uh, when the cloud gets beaten up. There's a lot of things that happened there and I want to be efficient with the amount of shots we used and it worked out, but that was a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, final encounter between uh, Weston and Olson and Vincent uh, that had its own challenges, but we were, I think we were pretty efficient with the amount of shots we used to keep the tension on and stuff. I think we didn't want to draw attention to Photography, as you said, nicely, it's an hotel once so you said that. Um, it is beautiful, I think. But we didn't want to call attention to it. And I like it to be in the movie, if you watch it 10, 15 years from now, you're not going to go, oh, yeah, that's the way they were serving all the school of stuff, you know, 2023. <laughs> <laughs> I want it to be to last. You know? I want it to feel like you're, that it's a movie from that's really showing real behavior, real language, real landscapes where if you're someone who appreciates photography or you're a cinematographer, you look at it and go, wow, we must have a great job there. But it doesn't, you know, doing some sweeping, crazy shot that you're like, oh wow, that's a great camera work. I, I hope that doesn't feel like that. Can you talk about Vivian's death scene and maybe working with Vicky as well? Yeah, I mean, it's mainly she inhabits that role. I mean, she, Every time I watch her, you know, and I watch it again, we were like, we were guys tonight. She's not really, it doesn't, she's not playing her, she is her. <laughs> she's like so, uh, every, there's not, every moment is great. And that's a, an example, of course, you know, to some degree there's makeup, because she's not well and so forth. And we didn't, we didn't, you know, it was meant to be early, you know, it's morning. 
I'm just sort of coming up. But it's, we didn't like um, adjust her in terms of lighting to make her, I mean, that's just acting. She really seemed like, as you say, like she inspired. And even though it was certain, I guess, uh, sickly kind of makeup, there was something else that happened. Just as in other scenes, and we've seen this in other movies where there are kinds of dreads, as an example, where she's luminous, you know, where you can see, feel her feelings, or whatever she's thinking, kind of like through her skin almost, right? In this way, it was almost like a retreating of that light. Um, even as the lights went out at the very end of the scene, the lights going out of the no, I'm sorry. I don't know how she did that. Any particular influences, westerns or otherwise? Um, I mean, I love watching movies, and I and I do like westerns. Although I'm the first to recognize that, as in any genre, most of the movies in any genre are not good movies. But preparing a western, you know, I watched all the westerns I'd seen. Hundreds more, super low budget, old serials, and and when you're preparing a movie like this, it's you know you're looking for different things. It's like yeah, sure, it's enjoy more enjoyable to watch well told, well written stories, well photographed, but sometimes it's just so that I could send you know poor Carol Spear, our production designer, I would send her and Anderson, our costume designer. You know, hundreds of movies really. <laughs> and say, well, <clears throat> look at this scene. Look at the, you know, look at the bar top, or look at the window, or what do you think about this sash, or you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just sharing those things. Or for actors, I'd say, Sally and Lada, I'd say, okay, this is a terrible movie, but <laughs> look at this guy in the scene he's on YouTube or something. Look how he gets on the horse. Um, look how this guy holds the reins. Look at this man, how he wears his hat, or how he leans on the bar. And just those little things, it's just fun to share them. And everybody comes into making this work, you know, so the feeling at the end, because of all that careful work, was, was a, a feeling of collective satisfaction, you know. Um, but it wasn't just Westerns, you know, I would look at all kinds of things. I mean, there was movies that I looked at, you guys have a certain. When you use time, uh, transitions, uh, whether it's Tarkovsky, uh, some of his films, and whatever, so, you know, it wasn't just Westerns. Um, although we were healing as close as we could to make it completely realistic and respecting a certain, I guess, certain conventions, you know, between how classic the good ones were shot. Um, but we weren't, I was, it wasn't like, well, there's nothing wrong with it. Some about it. It wasn't like this is an homage to uh, this movie. This is a, I mean, the only thing I was, I was watching it now, the only thing I could think of where I was at all conscious was a movie that would not really help you in a Western, I would think, which is The Passion of Joan of Arc. There's a moment in this saloon where Wilkins, who's the scapegoat, he's passed out drunk, he's got his gun, and the two of the the other Jeffrey's cowboys there, he's finally finished parading this, this hackamore um, as a horse, nose name, and they sort of put it on his head, and it was kind of like, when we were doing it, I was like, oh, that's kind of like, you really thought about him when you put that joke in, put that little crown, and make a straw on her head, if you've seen that movie. Anyway, but it wasn't like, we must do this shot because of that. It was only as we were doing it, I thought about it. But no, we weren't referencing. You know, it wasn't like this is an homage to, or this is where we were doing a certain scene. You know. Nothing wrong with it, it just wasn't. I just figured that whatever I've seen in, uh, in life, but also in movies, whatever is going to work for any given scene, if it hasn't come to me as we're preparing, it'll come to me as we're doing it. Without thinking about it, without even being conscious of it. So. Well, what was it about him that wanted to make you play him and maybe your feelings on him as well? Well, to be honest, I had no intention whatsoever of playing him. Um, and, you know, the role was cast and stayed cast for a good six months. Um, 
shared movies and talked and had a great relationship and um, and suddenly that actor decided to do something else. Um, something that would, I guess, pay him a lot more money. And, uh, <laughs> but the problem for us was that it was so late, and then you play these producers, it's been a producer, and I was having difficult that can be, especially these days when there's a lot of work or like, a strike or something, like, series and all kinds of stuff. And so people are busy, and when you're just approaching pre production, you're like, oh, are you the train's about to leave the station? To find someone who's available is tricky, and there was a couple, it was three people I went to after that who all loved the character, loved the script, but they were already they were taken as what to do. And it was fine, and I was like, well, I have to find somebody who's available. Who the finance here was said, yeah, that person could be. And I sort of, I was like, I'm going to have to ask Vicky about this. I was like, Delaying that, so I talked to the co producer and said, What do you guys think? And I don't like the idea. I didn't want to act because I want to really get it in my first movie, and it's okay, it was a good thing, but I prefer not to. And uh, plus, I'm older and it's not going to work, you know what I'm saying? So I have to change certain things. And they said, Well, we think it would work. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> So I need to ask Vicky, so I called Vicky. Yeah, I was thinking about, uh, I'm going to say, that. so is he going to do it? The last guy that we found to, and I said, no, I'm afraid not. So all three of them, they're busy for sure. You can't because they're great, and they want to respect that last one. So anyway, what I was going to say is, um, I was thinking, um, maybe that uh, <laughs> it's okay. So this is you talking to me. she's going to do it. And I said, that's what I was going to do. This movie around here. I don't know if that would be sure because, you know, you can lie and you can see that you know this character. So I'll have to change the world, I'm going to change his nationality, but above all, I will have to add some lines. You know, so that's why she says, You're too old to go to war. I said, mm, Maybe it's just a yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then when Weston sees me, think, I won't blow you out of your, you and the boy out of your, your saddle, old man. You know, so those are, you know, Let's deal with the reality of it, you know, pretend. <laughs> um, but it seemed okay with her, which was my main concern. It was acceptable to my producers. We just did it. Now it's kind of, it was, makes sense. But at the time, I was like, uh, this is already good. It's so shoot. <laughs> but it worked. It was that, and I did enjoy it. And I love what I most said. It's nice. It was nice to be in that world. And, and I guess there's a certain advantage to not just being on the camera watching, but to be in the scene with someone that you really read. And it's there's a strange realization that comes from if you're directing at the same time, you're you're ideally paying attention to everything. So you forget almost to be nervous as an actor. So I'm kind of like bring up the lines that I wrote it, but I'm just like in the scene, but I'm also enjoying you know what the character does, you know, all of a sudden it does this this change in her face, and uh, even as I'm interacting, I'm seeing that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a strange thing. But the next one, really, really, I'm not going to. Big up. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sure I remember to get in there. And you too. Very happy to be here. That's all we need to do. And that's it. Hey, this is Eric from MyOwnCinema.com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side.